Aloha, my name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist here in Honolulu. And I wanted to welcome you once again to Shrink Wrap Hawaii. And I am really excited because I have a fabulous actress sitting, waiting to come on right on my left side here. And I saw her in a play uh, put on by the Actors Group about, I, the one I saw was about 10 days ago, and it was called Coyotes. And uh, welcome to Shrink Wrap Hawaii, Rebecca Thank you. Lee McCarthy. Thanks for having me. So, uh, as I was telling you before, I loved the play, Coyotes, mm -hmm. and you as the lead uh, just blew me away with your interpretation of that part. Thank and, you. Um, could you be so kind as to fill our audience in, uh, give us a little thumbnail about what happens in the play? Well, the play is written by a local playwright, first of all. His name's Eric Anderson. He lives over on the Big Island, uh, and he's just a, a marvelous playwright. We're very lucky to have had uh, his work uh, grace our theater, and it's really fantastic. But he tells the story of a woman who is searching for love, basically. Um, but our understanding of love, individually and collectively, is not always the same. So her search uh, takes kind of a left-hand turn, and because the show is over, I guess I can give you the spoiler mm -hmm. alert, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. she goes through many different types of love, uh, marital love. Uh, she goes through this idea of romantic love, this idea of, I would say, um, uh, pure love, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, altruistic love. Mm -hmm. She also experiences motherly love, and in the end she experiences the most amazing kind of love, in a sense, it's a love of freedom uh, without judgment. And that's kind of the idea of her journey, is, is her s searching for that perfect kind of love for herself as a human being. Okay, so um, what I saw on stage when you when it when the play opens, um, you're there with the character playing your husband, mm -hmm. and I got this sense of two people. Either <laughs> the connection has died, or never was. Mm -hmm. um, but there's two people who have seemingly lived a long time together, and used to each other's habits, and the guy, he's like a piece of wood, sitting there reading the newspaper, and your character uh, is trying to connect in some way, it looks like, mm -hmm. but is being totally taken for granted, ignored, uh, and it's painful to watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It was a interesting scene to work on because, pretty much, you hit it on you know the nail on the head. Mm -hmm. Is that it, it, it's a relationship that she says later on in the play when she meets somebody who captures her heart. She says that her marriage was one of convenience. That and a line that was actually cut from the play uh, during the process of rehearsal was that she had said something to the effect of. Um, it was both getting very late. It was getting very late for both of them, and so they decided to get married. So mm -hmm. they got along. They probably could converse to some degree, but I don't think that there was any spark there in that particular relationship. No, that's, that was and clear. And as time goes on, they just lost the ability to find interest in each other. So there's another line she says at one point when she talks about her parents and they didn't like music. And she says something to the effect of, uh, it's not that they thought it was sinful or anything like that. They just had no interest in it as if it were bad mitten. And I always thought that that was a really good description of her first marriage. <laughs> that it's just, we're just doing it. It's just bad mitten, back and forth, back and forth without uh, any no passion passion any need uh, not even really any friendship there just uh, just going through the motions and she didn't even seem to be getting her sh her half of whatever it was it was like if it was a marriage of convenience it looked to be mostly his convenience <laughs> like 
it takes him a while to realize she's gone when she leaves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and does. then they ask, the, the, the neighbor comes over or something and says, well, I don't know, somebody asks him, you know, well, he says, she went to get my cleaning or drop off my cleaning. And he didn't even know a cleaner. Yeah, has no idea about her life or what she does to... For uh, him? For, for him or the family. Um, but, you know, one could say that is, you know, I always thought it was partly her fault, too. Mm -hmm. um, how much has she tried to reach out in the past? Right. How much has she tried to engage? It's interesting when we see the husband character throughout the play, he does engage with the new woman he finds. Yes. He's the next door neighbor. Now they engage through food. Yeah. They communicate through food. Uh, and story, and she's a bit dominating yeah. as compared to uh, my character. Right. But uh, they, they, there is something there yeah. uh, until the very end. In the very end, there seems to he seems to go back to where he was uh, with me. So obviously, something she's not able to reach him either. And and of course, the big question is how much did she try? I'm sure she tried, mm -hmm. um, but. I think for the motivation for my character is in her brain, her feelings is that she, she uh, tried her very, very best over and over and over again, and she just knows she's going to die if she stays there. Mm. So now that's interesting because it leads me to what uh, I was curious about, how you built this character. Um, so you, what you seem to have done is you create this backstory. Mm -hmm. Right, where yeah. you said your, your character's name is Evie? Eva. Eva. So you've given her a life that starts before the play. Oh, yeah. yeah. How do you do that? Um, you know, I think it is uh, evolution. Um, and every actor goes through it, I think, a little bit differently. I just start with the words. And I um, find little bits of evidence throughout. Mm. So like I told you before, there was a line in there about her parents not liking music. Yeah. Um, and her mom telling her to stop. So that was a huge clue for me. Mm. And that helped us build that first scene with the husband and wife because he stops her every time she hums. He, oh, he makes right. a noise right. or he hits the newspaper. Or, yeah. uh, and then uh, other characters stop her too. The only character really doesn't stop her. There's a couple characters, but um, uh, the one, the, the man she leaves her husband for. The, the he, one she meets in the museum. Yeah, he sings to her. And yeah. it's that moment where he sings out loud that she goes, oh, all right, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. This is, I have to do this. That's, that's her, uh, her, her little nugget, right? So, but then the obvious question is, she meets this guy in the museum who is very forward, <laughs> and uh, seems to be everything her husband wasn't. Right. And charming. Yeah. And interested in her. Mm -hmm. And wants to build a relationship. And they make an agreement mm -hmm. to meet the next day because she says, oh, I have to take care of, have to get my things in order. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go back to her house and tell her husband I'm gone forever or whatever. Right. And then she doesn't show. Right. So... Did you, as the actress playing this character, decide for yourself why she doesn't show? Oh, absolutely. I think it's vital. Um, all of us, even if we're not terribly conscious of the fact, we always have a motivation for how we behave. Right. Um, and uh, if you are a performer, you have to be aware of that motivation. You may not play the awareness, yeah. but you have to be aware of where it comes from, if you will. So for, for, for my character, um, there's a line with her new man where he tells her, oh, you're just so beautiful. And she realizes in that moment that her beauty uh, will only last so long to him. Like in my uh, in creating my backstory, my first husband said to me, "Oh, you're beautiful, and we can have a life together." And so she hears it again, and she thinks to herself, it, "It's not going to be enough." Oh. So the the beginning is never enough. You have to have more to continue, and she doesn't want to find herself in the same place. Mm. And I think she doesn't trust intimacy after her husband. 
she doesn't trust that intimacy can be sustained mm -hmm. without there being a leash mm -hmm. attached. So there's a line in the second scene that you see me with the, the, the my, my new gentleman, Carrie, yeah. um, or Cappy, call the character Cappy, where she says, I feel like I have a new uh, a, a leash on life. And then she corrects herself. She says, lease. <laughs> So that's in the script. It's in the script. And so these are the little keys that you start to find when you uh, are, are, are a performer, I think. At least that's what I do is I, I find those little moments and then I apply it to my backstory and then I apply it for each scene. And then I f try to find where uh, the path goes through the words. And, and with this script, it was really wonderful because the author gave us several phrases that were said over and over and over again mm -hmm. um, in different scenarios mm -hmm. at different moments. And these phrases became, for me, the anchor uh, of my backstory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I mean, as a, uh, in my practice as a therapist, mm -hmm. about half the work I do is with couples. And even most of the work that I do that's with individuals is about their primary relationship mm -hmm. with their significant other, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife. And what you just described, I think is always there, the balance between intimacy and feeling like you're on a leash. Mm -hmm. And so she opts to run because she decides it's, she doesn't want to risk her freedom. Never, right, for her. The moment a leash is placed on her, um, she can't breathe. Yeah. It's like having, uh, and, and uh, one of the things is, it's interesting, you always, you can only use what you got as an yeah. actress, right? Right, right? So, but you have to be willing to use what you have. Right. And I have panic disorder, and I also have <sighs> anxiety disorder, and I've had it my entire life. So I capture that feeling, oh, or boy, I try to you. capture that feeling of, what it feels like at that moment when you can't breathe, when, when it, you know, the, the panic, all the, the, the chemicals flood your body, uh, which is why I told you earlier that I think was so exhausting to do this play is that I knew I'd have to tap into it all the way through in order to be successful with this particular character because she has to go through this crazy evolution to where she goes mad. Uh, at the end of the play. She goes mad. She separates herself from all humanity and the only uh, being she can communicate with is a, a, a coyote. And even the coyote she has some struggles with. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is very brave of you to use that. Uh, and I just thought of this woman that I, I'm working with who in her previous relationship, she could never get close to this guy and she was always looking for more affection, more attention, mm -hmm. and that ended. And now she's terrified because her new boyfriend, he just wants to be with her all the time. He doesn't have another life. <laughs> <laughs> and she feels like smothered. Right. Like, no, I can't go away. Find a hobby, not yeah. me. <laughs> Isn't some of that stuff, though, timing, I wonder, you know, of people's lives and, and oh, their yeah. timing being right? I mean, uh, I'm in a relationship right now with somebody that I, uh, we both work from home. Mm -hmm. We uh, both act. We go and we work out together. We are together all the time. And I think any other point in time in my life, I would have been the same way. <laughs> I would have been, oh, this is too much. <laughs> I mean, it's a 300 square foot space we live in, you know. Wow. Uh, but How long have you been together? Uh, we've uh, two, two and a half years. Uh -huh. And, it's, and you, you, you revealed to me that he was your husband in the right, play. Right, in, in the play, right. Yeah. And we do was lots of weird? theater. No, um, actually, we're constantly cast um, opposite each other. Uh, we were in American Dream together, um, and uh, we were in Defiance together, and I think uh, our energies just work really well. We play, like from the first day we started working together on stage, we just worked really well together, which is odd because our technique or how we approach it is entirely different. Hi, I'm Nicole Alexander Enos, and I was born three weeks ago. <laughs> Congratulations on being there for me for some of the few weeks of my life. 
I'm starting a new show, The Millennial Mind, every Wednesday at 2 p.m. for the month of April, where we'll go over some of the reasons why millennials are some of the most anxious and frustrated people at the moment. Hey, has your signal just been taken over, or am I supposed to be here? This is Andrew, the security guy, your co-host on Hibachi Talk. Please join us every Friday on Think Tech Hawaii. Hi, I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia. I'm the host of Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. It's a program where we discuss the impact of change on workers, employers, and the economy. So join us every other Tuesday from 4 o'clock to 4.30. We're live in the studio on Working Together in Think Tech Hawaii. Take care. See you soon. Bye. Welcome back to Shrink Wrap Hawaii. I'm Steve Katz, still with my guest, Rebecca Lee McCarthy, and we're talking about the crossover between art and life, theater, <laughs> uh, the play Coyote in this case. And uh, you were just saying you had several therapists come see the play. Yeah, we did. We did. And I think it's uh, quite the same reason that, you know, you, you were kind of interested is the the navigating of the relationships right, and right. also um, uh, how do you allow yourself to go to a place of madness and then mm. emerge if you do it, if you try to really commit to the moment of that madness, what does it mean to disengage from your brain? I've had a couple people ask me that and I'm not sure I have a good answer for it. Do you felt like that's what you did in the play? Oh yeah, most definitely. A sort of a dissociative disorder, we call it. <laughs> is that what it is? Yeah, no, well, I did. Well, they used to call it multiple personality disorder. Now they call it uh, dissociative disorder. Where yeah, you become it just, other people. Yeah, I think she. Well, I don't know. If she becomes a different person. She just checks out. Like, she just becomes engrossed in her own world, and that world no longer really connects with uh, the everyday world. Right, so um, she can still talk to, uh, we have a UPS man who actually is kind of her soulmate in a weird way. That's where the mother thing came out a little bit? No, that was the character before that. There was uh, Eagle, the young man. Uh -huh. uh, oh, right, 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 who she can't get rid of. Who she can't get rid of, a young boy who yeah. comes upon her house. She's already beginning to go into madness when this young man shows up at her doorstep, mm -hmm. injured, stabbed from being part of a drug deal. Right, yeah. And she feels that she has to help him, uh -huh. although she doesn't really want to. Right. But she feels it's her responsibility. Uh -huh. And he tries to use her. Right. To have yeah. a place to live, to yeah, have a yeah. place to stay. Yeah, he would have stayed there forever. And uh, he even tries to tell her that he loves her, and she knows. That she makes knows. her really angry. Yeah, it makes yeah. her really angry because she knows she's, he's lying. And mm. indeed, when she calls him on it, he goes, God, I just wanted a place to stay, you know? And she's like, you know, get out of here. But that moment is her break moment. Mm. So, but what about the relationship with the woman before that? The woman that she was working for and then the woman suggests partnership, which mm -hmm. sort of has an ambiguous uh, meaning, I think. Mm -hmm. Which, was that intentional? No, we, we talked about it a lot, uh -huh. about that possibility of it being uh, romantic as, as right. well as kind of a business partnership, uh -huh. but we decided against it uh, because there wasn't any text really in the scenes to entirely support that type of relationship. But the romantic kind. Romantic, right. but intimate, certainly. Yes. Sisters, I want to be sisters with you. So mm -hmm. for that character, she has um, a very spiritual bent and even as Eva goes in to interview with a job, the job is with, uh, for, your, for, for your viewers, uh, my character goes in for a job at Wellsprings, which is a clinic or a, a organization that helps uh, women who uh, are in a bad place. Right. And the head of the organization is very spiritual. I'd say she's even, um, uh, she imagines herself as a nun. Uh -huh, right, right, right. <laughs> um, so there's that type of intimacy between sisters, between nuns, that uh, is probably just as intense as it is for people who have a romantic. Uh -huh. uh, and but even that is too scary for, for Eva? I think what it is is this idea that uh, she is going to all of a sudden save everybody. Um, 
there's, you know, we're going to build one wellspring, then we'll build another wellspring uh -huh. is a suggestion that's made by the other character and that we'll be sisters. And every time she says we're sisters, my character, Eva, says, no, no, Marsha, we aren't sisters. <laughs> don't, please, please don't, because she doesn't feel comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And I think mostly for Eva, she feels like it's a lie. She can't trust anybody. Well, it's not only that she can't trust anybody, but to pretend that she's going to be able to make a huge difference in the world is to her a lie. And Eva is somebody who, who likes to imagine things, but she's probably not very comfortable with living uh, a life that con she'd consider to be a lie. Or but that's not depressing. Authentic. I mean, is that. Um I mean, that sounds like somebody who is really kind of depressed to me, somebody who doesn't believe that a person can make a difference in the world. Yeah, I think that she is at that place, though. Yeah. Because she doesn't necessarily believe in herself any more than she believes that... But she's able to go out and have these little mini successes after she runs away from her marriage. Yeah, but she doesn't want to commit to the successes. Right. She just wants to... I think she just wants to find a solution where she feels like she can breathe. And, and, and the she's only looking solution for solutions. she has is by herself. Yeah. Just to cloister herself off from society and from society's expectations. But then she goes off with the coyote and freezes to death. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't she have does. a happy ending. <laughs> but it is happy for her. I mean, I think she finds what she's looking for. So, but, but that's the interesting dichotomy between the, the actor and the character, right? So if I'm talking as the character, yeah. um, I probably wouldn't be sitting here. But if I'm talking as the character... <laughs> well, maybe just once. Just once. Um, she definitely finds what she's looking for. Uh, she, is, she holds the one thing that would never allow her to hold, a coyote. The coyote, I've decided at the end, she, it actually comes to her. She falls in the snow probably hurts herself. Uh, it's a blizzard. And the coyote doesn't run off, though. The coyote comes to her and lays on her and then dies with her. So there is... Uh, so as a therapist, I would say she gets close by finally making herself vulnerable. Yeah. And I would say that's exactly it. So, I mean, this can have ramifications uh, like in, in Honolulu, when you see somebody who is what we would call mad, mm -hmm. you know, somebody living off by themselves uh, in the forest on the pulley or mm -hmm. in a box somewhere. I mean, there's a big debate, you know, the ACLU says, leave these people alone, they deserve freedom. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, other people feel like these people need help, they really are ill mm -hmm. and they, they need even though they, they might not tell you they need help, it's our humane responsibility to help them. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I wonder about this woman because she takes care of herself. She meets her basic needs, right? She has mm -hmm. food and shelter until she doesn't. Right. But that's the, that's the rub, until she doesn't. Until she doesn't. Well, I think the, the question is, what kind of help? Who's, who's to say that a certain form of help is the right form of help? You know, so uh, the postman at the very end of the play wants to take care of her. There's snow coming, there's this, there's yeah, that. Yeah. And she's, she even looks at him and she goes, I've never been better. That's the last line she has to another human being in the play, basically. Well, she, she has to sign for a package, but that's the last serious line. And she absolutely believes she has never been better. She, uh, I imagine, by the time she gets to that part of the play, her anxiety is gone. She's not dealing with it day to day. She but is living it, it life on her own terms. It's almost a kind of terms. suicide. Is it, though? That's how it ends up. She dies. I don't think she wants to die. I think that you she... Think she just slipped and fell. I think she slipped and fell. Yeah. And, huh. But she lives out in the middle of nowhere, so there was nobody there to give her any help. The... Big mistake for Eva 
is that she didn't know from snow. So that's one of the things she says is, you know, he goes, oh, they've got a storm coming. I'm a little worried about you. And she goes, I know from snow. And she doesn't. <laughs> right. But, I mean, the whole idea that can a person be truly happy uh, by themselves? I mean, because they say, like, prisoners who, have, who are put in isolation will mm -hmm. tell you that that's the worst torture mm -hmm. of all. Yeah. is to be isolated without anybody else because we are, by our nature, in social relationships, animals. social yeah. animals. Yeah. Oh, you think she was really happy there? I do. I think the coy if the coyote wasn't there, I think there'd be a, a, a different Eva. But I think the coyote gives her all the socialization she really needs. Oh, so that was, that was her relationship. That was her relationship. Well, yeah, I mean, there's certainly plenty of people that have a pet, mm -hmm. a dog or a cat or yeah. whatever, and I guess that's enough. For her, For I her. mean, that's, that's the way I played it. That's the way I, yeah. you know, uh, ultimately came to the conclusion of for that character. For myself, I think it would be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> for most of us, yeah? Yeah, I don't need yeah. a lot of people, but just one or two real good yeah. ones are right. very, very helpful. Yeah. You know, I was just so fascinated... Uh, talking about the play. I never got to ask you anything. Where did you grow up? Oh, I grew up in Arizona. And uh, how did you come to the stage, the theater? I've always done it. Since little kid time? Since I was a little kid, yeah. yeah. So I got into theater when I was very, very young and did commercials and live theater in uh, Arizona growing up. And Why? What's the hook for you? I don't know. I mean, it's a real good question. I guess... Um, I just always wanted to be one of the people in the TV box originally. <laughs> and then at a certain point in time, I thought I wanted to be famous. But as I pursued it, what I realized was I was just interested in people's motivations, why people do what they do. So my other degrees are, I have a degree uh, in sociology, rhetoric, and philosophy. And each one of those areas is really just about exploring why, why people, people do what they do. Because I'm fascinated by the choices we make in life. And I'm fascinated and sometimes dumbfounded by some of those choices. And so I like to find, I like to find that motivation. Yeah. And i got to wrap us up. They're telling okay. me we're done. And I agree with you. Why do people do what they do? But I'm really glad you came today, Thank Rebecca. Thank you very Thank much you for so having me. Thank you so much for being here.